Gate City Bank presents the Bison Spring Game Green and Gold Preview Show. Hello and welcome into the Green and Gold Spring Game here from the Fargo Dome. We are getting set as North Dakota State concludes spring football practices. Today is called a spring game. Not so much a spring game, but still we will have a lot of fun and uh, a lot of stuff to talk about in the next hour and a half that you are with us here at the Fargo Dome. I am Alex Egan. He is Ryan Gellner, your pregame show host over the last year. Ryan, happy football Saturday. Football is back, at least for the most part. Football <laughs> is back. It doesn't seem that long ago that mid-December North Dakota State was last on that on this football field. And you remember the loss, of course, to James Madison, who eventually went on to win the national championship. Well, today things reset, and we'll see what kind of a motivating factor that James Madison loss is to this edition of North Dakota State University. Of course, that string of five straight national championships and 22 straight playoff wins is all over. So there is a lot to play for this season, and it is time for the spring game, the green versus gold game, where scoring's a little bit different. You're right, the ones aren't going to hit, so it's going to feel a little bit different than football. But rest assured, football is back at North Dakota State. Tell that to the fans out in the parking lots to getting their tailgating on. As you mentioned, it is the green and the gold. It is the offense versus the defense. The offense will be in gold. The defense will be in green. We'll hear from the guys calling the action in just a little bit. But first, let's go down to Beth Houle roaming the sidelines for us. Oh, wow. Let's go over to uh, LT and Brian Sean as we get set. They get set to uh, call ourselves a football game. Guys. All right, thanks so much, Brian, Sean, Lee Timmerman with you. And uh, excited to be back here in the spring to talk a little football and get our fix before uh, moving into the fall. Of course, the home opener, the season opener on September 2nd against Mississippi Valley State. And LT, we had a chance to sit down with both coordinators. Courtney Messingham, the new offensive coordinator, a longtime friend of Chris Kleiman from his childhood. And then Matt Entz, the defensive coordinator, now coming into his fourth year. And both of them, I think, are in different positions. Courtney Messingham still trying to learn all his players. Matt Entz feeling really good about where the defense is right now from a depth standpoint. Said it was his most enjoyable spring he's had since he's been here. Well, it should be. When you have five defensive tackles you think are going to play, five or six defensive ends that you know can play, already that position group is really uh, is really set. With the veterans coming back at linebacker, you have veterans at safety. Yeah, the defensive side certainly in a very good place. But you're right. Talking with uh, Coach Messingham, it was just a little interesting because he goes through the first three weeks or so he goes I'm still looking at guys and I'm getting the look back from the guys going does he really know what my name is so that's one of the things that coach Bessingham has had to do not just go hey number 63 do this but get a name to a face I know a lot of the ones Alex and Ryan talked about it we will see thought the ones will yeah, not thought. have a lot of contact no, no. but but there's still some depth competition going on between the twos and threes who's going to fit where that's what I think we'll see more today that and I think offensive line is a real interesting position because you go back to coach Kleiman's first year here I believe it was his first year he had to replace four starters on the offensive line now we had three offensive line starters graduate just but from talking to coaches and seeing the talent level the offensive line is going to be real good we don't know who's going to be in all the spots yet but they're going to be young but I think they're going to be really good and wide receiver may be the one yeah. position on offense that is the biggest mm -hmm. concern right now as we head into the fall. Without a doubt, R.J. Erzendowski is not going to play today. He doesn't really have to play today. But the, the lack of depth, if you want to call it that, on the from the wide receivers really affected the quarterbacks a little bit in uh, in the spring because the quarterbacks uh, didn't quite have as many guys to keep going out there to get the double reps like the Bison like to do. And yes, you did sign or get a commitment mm -hmm. from Desmond Kane, yeah. who is a receiver transfer from the University of Illinois that had a really, really big freshman season before having some injury concerns last season. But a guy they think they hope that can step in and play right away as well. We'll throw it back to Alex and Ryan. Here's our coverage of the Green and Gold game continues here on the KBLY KFYR Bison Network. Thank you very much, guys. As you mentioned, there are a few guys that will be sitting out today's game due to some injuries. Let's go down to Beth Houle, roaming the sidelines for us. She has more in our Sanford Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Injury Report. Beth, how are you doing? Hey, Alex, doing well down here on the sideline as the teams are warming up, getting ready for this annual green and gold spring game. Excited to talk to some of these guys throughout. Uh, one of those guys I'm going to be talking about is kind of front and center on this Sanford Orthopedic Sports Medicine injury report. That's Nate Tangway. He was recovering from ACL surgery, uh, took that injury late in the season and missed that playoff run, leaving a huge hole on the Bison defense. He's still recovering from that, but doing well. You can see him running around at practices all through 
throughout this spring practice, uh, getting back into form. He says he'll be ready to go. We'll check in with him, though, uh, when it comes down to where he will be come fall when they get ready to take on Eastern Washington and kick off that 2017 football season. Nick DeLuca, a guy we've seen taking reps in practice, left early, took a medical redshirt with his shoulder injury, uh, played through that Iowa game, though, and was a dominating force for this Bison defense. Uh, he'll be back this year. We expect to see him taking maybe a couple of reps with the ones. Again, that's no contact, though. Some of the new guys that have developed injuries during the spring season, RJ Erzendowski with a bit of a hip flexor. He'll be sitting out again, though, like Brian and LT said, not someone you need to see a lot from. He's already put himself on the record as a dominating force for those wide receivers. And then Adam Cofield at running back with a bit of an ankle injury right now. They'll be sitting him out along with a couple of other guys. We'll hear from uh, head team doctor Brian Pyatt later in the halftime report to check in on how some of those surgeries went and what it means for Sanford Orthopedic to be a partner with NDSU Athletics. All right, thank you very much, Beth. As uh, we mentioned here, the 2017 schedule is uh, coming upon us quickly. We'll take a quick peek at that here. Uh, Mississippi Valley State is who the Bison will open up with right here at the Fargo Dome. That will be September 2nd. And then, as Beth mentioned, they will be on the road at Eastern Washington. Uh, uh, an unfamiliar face, but Robert Morris making a, uh, an appearance here in Fargo September 23rd in the regular season. And then that... Uh, Oh, that Missouri Valley Football Conference. Conference slate. <laughs> yeah, those first it three tough. games, a it couple of tough. teams with a win or two last year. So maybe a couple of uh, easy games, you might say, for North Dakota State with uh, Mississippi Valley State and Robert Moore. Eastern Washington, we know about them. They've got their stud quarterback returning. And then it's that gauntlet of the conference season. That conference schedule does not look fun at Youngstown State. That will be the only game that we won't have for you here on the KBLY KFYR Bison Football Network. All the rest of them, tune in here on Saturdays, and we will have you covered. We're going to step aside when we come back. We've got so much more for you. Beth Wool sits down with Courtney Messingham here on the Bison Spring Game Green and Gold. Brought to you by Gate City Bank. Welcome back inside the Fargo Dome as we are getting set for spring football here to conclude at North Dakota State University. The 15th of 15 spring practices we will see today. Uh, and it's been a, a while, two years, that the Bison coaching staff was together. This offseason, a little bit of turnover. Tim Polisek heads and takes a job at Iowa, which opens the door for a new offensive coordinator to come in, a guy that Coach Kleiman is very, very familiar with. Beth Houle sat down with Courtney Messingham to get to know him a little bit better. The first thing that made a no-brainer is, uh, you know, every time they were in Frisco, uh, buddies of mine that, that played here that, that go down there sending me pictures and you see 15,000 Bison fans in, in Frisco, Texas. Um, so you know the support that there is in the community and, and statewide, and that, that support actually goes all the way over into Minnesota, obviously, you, you Minneapolis area. We've got great support throughout the, the, the northern Midwest. How has it been diving in to Bison football? Well, the, the good thing about it is I knew, I knew the, the style of football they play. You know, we, we've talked a lot of times, uh, Coach Palasek and I and the rest of the staff, we, you know, we've sat and talked football and, and how they go about it and why they've been successful. Um, Coach Ants, when he had the opportunity to come here, obviously I'd spoken with him quite a bit. I've known him since he was in eighth grade. So, so when he had this opportunity, I was uh, excited for him. And then when I had the opportunity, he obviously was very excited for, for my opportunity to come over here as well. What stands out to you about Bison football on the field? The biggest thing is players playing for each other and understanding that the guy next to him is going to be the guy making that play. Um, the reason, you know, you, you can go back and, and there's some... You know, K-State game is an example, the, the, the drive. I mean, they convert on a, on, a, on a screen, shovel pass basically, screen inside, and you're just like, wow, that's a heck of a play. I mean, you never know which guy is going to be the guy to make that play, but the guys believe in themselves and they believe in the guy next to them. Next to them. People here feel like NDSU is different from other FCS programs. You've experienced a few. How different is North Dakota State? Well, to be very honest with you, the, the crazy part is is they, they want to be successful, but they want to support you. I've been places before that, nah, they want you to be successful, and they're, they're not very happy when things don't go well, but they're not ready to go support you. They're not ready to be out there, you know, tailgating when, it, when it's cold and, and then coming in and packing the dome. 
You know, a lot of places I've been, they expect you to win, but they don't expect that, that, that they need to put the support part in, and, and this place obviously does. I mentioned you've made a couple stops. Some of those stops have been in the FBS. Mm -hmm. How do you think those experiences have shaped you, molded you, and benefited you for this role right now? And getting an opportunity to be at, in the Big 12 and, and uh, you know, Conference USA when I was at Southern Miss, those places, uh, it's, you know, Saturday is a big deal. Um, but that that's helped will help me when I get here because Saturday's a big deal around here as well. But when you're at, in a Big 12 setting, boy, every weekend you better have your A game or, or you're going to get exposed. And that's one of the things I think the Missouri Valley is. I mean, you better be ready when we go play at Northern Iowa or Northern Iowa comes here. You go play at uh, uh, you know any of the schools, Illinois State, uh, Youngstown State. You better have your A game. And I think that those experiences I've had have helped prepare me for that. What's a Courtney Messingham offense look like? What should people expect? Well, the biggest thing that I want to make sure we do is take what the defense gives us. You know, kind of the, you know, uh, Hayden Fry used to call it scratch where it itches. And, and basically that's just saying if they're going to allow you to run the football, that's what we're going to do. And, and we need to do that because that's, that's our MO. That's who we are. But we've got to be able to take advantage of opportunities. And if they give you the opportunity to throw the football, we've got to be efficient and throw the football and be successful throwing it. You've had an opportunity to get to know Easton Stick a little bit now. Uh, what do you make of him? Well, the, the most impressive thing to me about him is he's a competitor, but he's very even keel. He doesn't, you know, he, he's not a roller coaster. He's got uh, great command and great presence where when you see how competitive he is, you see how he runs the football when he has, has some stuff where he'll keep it on a quarterback run. Boy, he's, got, he's ready to lower his shoulder and go hit people and be physical, yet he's very cerebral. He's able to get back and think football for the, on the next play. How do you challenge him? Where does he go from here? How do you guide him to that next level for this season? To me, the biggest thing is that next level. And for him to take the next step, now he's got to become a, a true extension of the coaching staff. He's got to be a guy out there that, that is ready to tell that guard, hey, well, no, 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 this is what you need to do. This is how you're going to do it. And our guys will respect him because they know he's already been out there and played. You know, he, he's had a lot of starts. For, for being a guy that has two years left, he's had a lot of starts. I mean, you go into different coaching positions in all kinds of different situations. Looking into a bad situation here by any means, are, are you kind of giddy? I mean, how exciting yeah. is that? It's, it's extremely exciting because all of us in our profession want a high standard. We want, we want expectations to be high, and they're very, very high here. We know that if we're not in Frisco, that, that we're probably not having the type of season that we expect or, or the fans expect. Um, but that's all right. I'm, I'm fired up about it because of the support, because of the, the, the things that are put in place for us to be successful. What do you make of your position group? You know, I'm fortunate because both Bruce and Lance, uh, they, they've been through the fires. They're, they're older guys. They're somewhat more like an Easton stick where, you know, sometimes it's now letting them have some input. They're, they're trying to be an extension of a coaching staff. But that's also why we're so successful as a program is they are holding each other to a high standard. It's not just the coaching staff holding them to a high standard. You have been through spring football. You've gotten to reunite with, as you said, some people uh, that, that you know very well. What's it been like reuniting with Chris Klein and Matt and some of those guys? The, 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 the interesting part is there's still that competitive dynamic. You know, Coach Ants and I, we've known each other a long time, yet when we're out on the practice field, when we're scrimmaging, you know, we, we want to win. I mean, yeah, that's good. I've known him for a long time, but I still want our guys to get after his guys. I, I want us to be successful, and, and that part of it's fun. But, but we grew up that way. I mean, we grew up being competitive, yet when it's over, you're able to shake hands and, and you know, relax a little bit and feel good about yourself and also feel good about the guy you're coaching with. You're a window into Chris Kleiman. I mean, I have to ask you, how, how different is he from when he was a kid or how, how similar is he to still who he is? Pretty, pretty similar because he's always a guy that's been very even keel, been very, uh, you know, cerebral, uh, understood the game really, really well. I mean, when we first started uh, uh, playing, actually we started playing baseball, um, fifth grade, I was fifth grade, he was fourth grade. And, you know, very, very good athlete, but he understood what he was doing all the time. And that's when, when he was playing football in college, he, you know, shoot, he started as a true freshman, not because he was the best athlete, but because he understood the game better than anybody else. Your hopes for NDSU football this year? Continue to grow, um, get back to where we, where we want to be and need to be, and that's get back to Frisco. But the biggest thing for that to happen is us understand, attack the process, and continue to grow as an offense. 
Well, we want to thank Beth Hool and Courtney Messingham for sitting down. What did you take away from, from Courtney Messingham? They call him Coach Mess here. He's a guy that's been at every level of college football, and I think that only helps coming in. Heck, he, he called plays in the Big 12. Yeah. I mean, and here's a guy that comes in with a lot of experience. Last year at Montana State, a team that frankly wasn't very good, a team that was riddled with injuries, they were still third of the Big Sky in running the football. So he can run the football, but no joke about it, he is a guy that loves to throw the football. He's had good quarterbacks, he's had good wide receivers, and now the question is, can Easton stick and this core of wide receivers live up to what I think Coach Mess wants to instill into them? And there's two other guys that I'm sure have a very a strong opinion about Coach Messingham, Brian Sean Lee Timmerman. You guys, what, what are you making of uh, Coach Mess in his first spring here with the Bison? Well, I think the one thing that we learned, and it was kind of fun to get to know Coach Messingham in his past, is he said, you know, up until about 2007, I was a pro-style guy as an mm -hmm. offensive coordinator and then went to places that were more of a spread out of the gun. So he's coached both ways. So he's kind of coming back to his roots, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, he, he said, I get, I, I almost can take my playbooks back from the 90s, late <laughs> yeah. 90s, and pull them out and use them. And when you talk about pro style, what is that? It's the quarterback under center. You're using tight ends and, uh, and, and running backs, and you're using play action. So those are the types of things that the Bison continue to do and continue to do well, and that's... You know, you watch another game going on on a Saturday afternoon, and there's not much of that going going on at all. And it's one of the reasons that Carson Wentz was as ready to play as an NFL rookie as he was is because of the pro-style offense that the Bison play. And we also found out Coach Messingham is a really good friend of former offensive coordinator Brent Vegan. Yes. They actually have a long-standing relationship. Of course, Vegas getting promoted to associate head coach at Wyoming. So there is a connection there, certainly. But I think the other piece, when you, the guys were talking about the passing game a little bit, LT, is he said Easton Stick is going to have to trust receivers yep. four, five, and six, not just one, two, and three, and not just lock in on those guys. If that a guy that he's down. supposed to go, he's got to throw it on time and expect that guy to be there. That didn't always happen last year. We know that. We talked with Coach Polisek and talked to Coach Hedberg about that. It's a fail-safe thing. And when when the, the stress is coming and the guys are coming and you're the quarterback, you're going to go to someone you really trust. And so that de that developing that trust within the wide receiver core is something that the Bison will have to work on, not only, you know, throughout the rest of the spring, which it ends today, but into the fall and into the games. All right, Alex Ryan, back to you much guys as uh, they are having the Missouri Valley Conference ring ceremony their sixth straight Missouri Valley Conference championship for North Dakota State nothing to scoff at very good to have a conference championship it's just a little tough when you've won five straight national championships uh, as well so that they are getting their rings from their sixth straight uh, Missouri Valley Football Conference championship right now we will step aside when we come back there's a new fueling station that the bison athletes have been able to uh, get used to and use and we've got that more on inf information on that when we return welcome back to the green and gold spring game brought to you by gate city bank gate city doing a lot of wonderful things in our community and for north dakota state athletics their latest contribution is a state-of-the-art fueling station just outside the brand new weight room. It's just the latest piece in the puzzle that's taking NDSU athletics to new heights. Nutrition has a huge impact on all of our athletes. Uh, I think you can have, as a coach, you can have the best training plan. I think you can have the best practice plan. I think you can have the best culture, the best intensity, all those things. Uh, but if you can't recover from your training, you're not going to be healthy to go into the next practice. You're going to get beat down. You're going to get tired. You're going to get sore. You're going to get sick. You can get injured. Uh, and here at North Dakota State University, we put a, a premium on nutrition. And, and my job as a strength condition professional is to help them reach their potential. And the fueling stage has been provided by Gate City and our access to nutritional products for our athletes helps them reach their potential. It helps them gain weight, it helps them train harder, it helps them practice at a higher level, and more importantly, it keeps them healthy. And for us here, reach your potential is about staying healthy. It's about day in, day out, doing your work. You have to have the ability to train hard, practice hard, and recover from that training all the way throughout your four or five years to fully reach your potential. At Gate City Bank, we are committed to our customers, communities, and team members for a better way of life. We are proud to partner with NDSU on the fueling station. It is important for a student's health and well-being to have proper nutrition to excel as an athlete. The fueling station is another way Gate City Bank can help provide a better way of life for student athletes. 
a wonderful a wonderful look for you there at that fueling station. I'm joined now by Sherry Smith, a VP with Gates, a senior VP with Gates City Bank. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Sherry. And if you can just kind of share why the fueling station? Why was this the contribution Gate City Bank decided to make? Sure. Well, thanks for asking, Beth. You know, at Gate City Bank, we are committed to our community, our coworkers, and our customers. And by working with the NDSU Athletic Department, we're able to um, really enhance the life of our student athletes by providing them better nutrition. What makes this fueling station kind of the next level? What does it provide for, for these student athletes? You know, for Gate City Bank, uh, we are invested in our community. And by providing a better way of life for our athletes by enabling them to have the proper nutrition to reach that next level of performance. That's really what's in it for us. And what's it mean for you guys for Gate City Bank to continue to partner with NDSU Athletics and make a mark with this program? You know, we're just excited to be part of this community. Gate City Bank is very committed to our community and we're just very happy to partner with NDSU Athletics. Well, thanks so much, Sherry, for joining us. And I know NDSU athletes are certainly thanking you guys for that fueling station. I know it gets a lot of love already and will for, for some time to come. Guys, stick with us. Coming up, we've got plenty more on this green and gold spring game brought to you by Gate City Bank. Welcome back inside the Fargo Dome. The green and gold spring game kicking off here shortly. But before we get to game action, we got to tell you about a guy that the Bison coaches, Bison fans, and even us in the media have been very, very high on since he got to campus last fall. And that is linebacker Jabril Cox. I caught up with him as spring football concludes to hear how his first spring in a Bison uniform is going. Finishing up his first spring with the Bison football team, redshirt freshman linebacker Jabril Cox has begun to take the next step in his development to be a key part of the Code Green defense. Uh, spring ball is going great. At first, I was really getting to know the defense and everything, and then now, since we've been progressing in spring ball, everything's coming a lot easier. When Cox got to Fargo last fall, defensive coordinator and linebackers coach Matt Ant says they weren't sure exactly what they had. Uh, we knew he was a defensive player. We thought he could help us on defense. Was he a Mike linebacker? Was he an outside linebacker? Where did he fit into the plans? And we kind of settled in in the offseason that he was going to be a Sam uh, outside linebacker for us, and he's done a really good job. And says Cox has had his moments in the spring where it seems like he might be a little lost on the field. But, you know, there's some base things that he knows and understands real well right now, and, you know, when he's out there, we try to get him to execute at a, at a fast pace. The plan as the spring concludes is to make Jabril a strong side linebacker, having watched and learned from Pierre G. Tucker last season and still picking up things from Chris Board this year. Ents and company like what they have. It's just a matter of Cox picking up the defense to earn playing time. Well, he can change direction unbelievably for a 6'3", 230-pound athlete, uh, one of our fastest players on the football team. Uh, and then I just think his range. I mean, he can play from sideline to sideline. Now, with that being said, he's got to understand and know what he's doing to play fast. So we're still, that's still a working process. Once I just learn a bit of the position, then I can move on further and then learn everything else. Cox says his biggest takeaway now, having been through an entire fall and now an entire spring. How much extra time you have to spend in the film room and learning the plays and getting everything down. That's what I took out of this. Certainly a guy the Bison are very high up on. We'll step aside one more time. When we come back, we've got game action for you here from the Fargo Dome. The Bison spring game brought to you by Gate City Bank. The twos are on the field, and for the action, we go over to Brian Sean and Lee Timmerman. Guys. All right, thanks so much, guys. As the twos, as Alex mentioned, are on the field. And how about the goal, the offense? Moving down the field, we're seeing some of these redshirt freshmen to LT get on the field for really the first time that we've had a chance to see him in a game action. One of those guys, Dylan Radins, that I think uh, the coaches are very high on. Uh, yeah, he's playing left tackle, and you, of all the players probably on the offensive side this spring, of especially the new guys, we've heard more uh, about him and praise of his athletic talents than probably anyone else. It's Damaris Purifoy, who's battling for position as well, along with Ty Brooks for kind of that two, three, four spot. Certainly Bruce Anderson and Lance Dunn 
have kind of solidified themselves as the top guys, but still some competition, along with redshirt freshman Adam Cofield, who is not playing today. That is one of the things on the to-do list this spring, is try to find out who that number three, especially three running backs going to be, and how good that number three running back is might allow the Bison to do more things with Bruce Anderson, because we know how versatile that, that he is. He can play all over the place on the offense. Tight end, another deep position. We'll see a lot of different guys there as Cole Davis <laughs> pushes it out, and it's caught by Daniel Polanski down to the 10. Cole Davis now going to be a senior. Maybe the, senior. the one guy that Courtney Messingham said has been his, his biggest surprise since he got here February 14th to now in terms of what he has shown him in practice. And last year, too, though, the same type of deal uh, throughout the season and talking with Coach Hedberg, the uh, quarterback's coach throughout the season, uh, you know, he said that Cole was was ready to play. He understands the offense. Obviously, he's been running it now for five years. And, uh, you know, he's just a guy that that insurance policy you love to have. He's, you know, backup quarterbacks, what? You hope they're good and you hope you don't have to play them. <laughs> Purifoy outside, <laughs> stayed on his feet, still on his feet, inside the five, and here goes almost got there. Almost got to the end zone. It will be enough for a first down as the gold leads it to nothing here in this scoring system. And just so everybody kind of knows from an offensive standpoint, it's three field goal, three for a field goal, six for a touchdown, that we know. Two for a PAT run pass, two for a long drive, which is 10 plus plays, one for a big play of 10 plus yards, and then one for a kick. Nodak Insurance Company replay here. It's Jackson Brown thinking he's got his man down back at the 15 yard line. And then Purifoy is able to kind of finish it with a little bit of strength and a little bit of physicality toward the end. And again, these are the number twos. These are the only the guys of the, of, the, of the ones and twos who are going to tackle all the way to the ground. When the ones play, it'll be called thud, and we, you'll see it in, when we get there. Ty Brooks inside the tackles, Fumble. lost the no. football, unless He's they across. called it a touchdown, and they did. Yeah, across before the ball came out. There's a look at Jabril Cox, too, number 42, that picked that up who has been really the talk. We just saw a story on him just a couple of moments ago, and uh, it's kind of been the talk of the spring in terms of just how freakish he is athletically. He, yeah. Matt Ent's telling us he may be the fastest player on, on the, the team, team. And, and that's he, over anybody else on the offensive side. And, and Matt this said flat out he's the best athlete that we have on the football field. And again, this guy is a freshman and who played quarterback. In, in high school, so he's making the transition to linebacker, very similar to the way that Carlton Littlejohn uh, did when, when he was in the program. He played, you know, a lot of quarterback in high school, developed into a, into a linebacker, a very good linebacker, but that's what Cox is trying to do. You know, when you're that athletic, <laughs> the, the thing is, is how fast are you going to absorb the mental aspect of the game and to make that work? That is Cox's biggest challenge right now and the bison are challenging me they're, they're throwing a lot at him this spring Ryan Geller Alex Egan as we have reached our first time out the offense moving down the field and getting a touchdown lead at 10-0 early we'll throw it back over to them for a look at another young receiver trying to step up his game here this spring all right thank you very much guys yeah the, the, the guy that I think a lot of the people are excited to see on the offensive side if you've watched the bison football show with coach Kleiman we talked about him a little bit last year in the future crop of bison he is 6'5 and a wide out. You can't help but notice his size. He is Sean Engel, and I caught up with him as well this spring to see how his first spring with the Bison football team is going. Sean Engel is a big presence for the Bison wide receiving core. At 6 foot 5 and 211 pounds, he's easy to spot on the football field. Well, obviously, a super big, long kid. Uh, that's, you know, probably his biggest thing right now is his, he's super long and uh, does a really good job of attacking the football when it's in the air. Engel is wrapping up his redshirt freshman year with the Bison in a room where there's a lot of talent for Easton Stick to throw to. Engel says he's still learning the offense and hopes to make an impact as soon as this fall. But he has to continue to learn. There's so much thrown at you at one time, so once you start overthinking, then you start start running wrong, wrong routes, you start not getting smooth plans, and you drop the ball every once in a while. His head coach and his quarterback agree it's about details now. 
he's still learning our playbook. He's still a true freshman, so he's still learning how to handle things and how to do things. And to be able to get on the same page with, with Easton, that's, that doesn't happen overnight. So this summer will be really big for him, but he's somebody that uh, will be able to get in the mix for us next year. Uh, now it's just moving on in the little stuff and understanding where are my safeties, what kind of leverage am I getting, things like that. And then just being able to play faster and, and you know, especially on those third down and, and, and those type of situations. But you can't help notice his size, which Ingle says is just another thing to learn how to deal with. A lot of things I have to do are different than other guys because I can't can't be as quick as them, so I got to use my size to my advantage. So it's just all, all part of getting used to it. And it's not hard for us in the media or fans or even some coaches on the Bison staff to compare him to another big bodied wideout who has hurt the Bison in the past. South Dakota State's Jake Wenicky. Yeah, I mean, that's who they brought me in to be like. I mean, he has he had a lot of success there. A 6'5 guy who can run a little bit. So I don't know, I feel like they, everyone has that expectation for me to try to try to be at that level at some point. But Kleiman says it's going to take time for Ingle to develop into the player they all want him to be. But he is coming along. Let's uh, let him grow and develop through the program. And, and however much he can help us this year, it's going to be a benefit. We know he can. Uh, a lot of his repetition and getting that game experience. But uh, uh, we're excited about what he can do over the next four years. Back with the ones on the field. Good look at Sean Engel there. And we saw a completion from Easton Stick real quickly. And then a run from Lance Dunn for a first down up to the 45. So this is what the offense looks like now. But the offensive line from our conversations with various coaches is really going to be a work in progress. Colin Connor may move inside. Austin Kuhner has been moved from center to guard. Tanner Volson has taken over center. They have some interchangeable parts right now on the offensive line, which is a good thing, LT. That is certainly the goal. You hope to have seven, at least seven. And as Coach Mess said, if we can get eight guys that we can rely on on that offensive line, then, uh, then things are really looking solid up there. And again, the offensive line is is fairly young. We we've talked about Raidens a little bit already. Some of the movement with uh, Kunert number 75 sliding from center over to one of the guard positions. Of course, we know in this offense with that eight gap power, those guards have to get out and pull. But I'm confident in this offensive line. I think they're going to be uh, really good. Also interesting to see Nick DeLuca back on the field <laughs> for great, the first it? time. It's been a long time for Nick. So it's a long seven months. He's just excited to be playing football again. And they're playing thud. Okay, so you're not going to tackle there. The play is dead. Lance uh, Dunn is not going to go down to the ground, and that's the reason, uh, because it's thud, that uh, that Nick is able to even play today. Because if this was full contact all out, he would not be playing. But he is learning a new position as well. So he's, uh, he's sliding outside a little bit because of the way that, you know, Matt Plank came in and played for Nick last year, played so well, and then they're going to move Nick into that, that little bit of an outside position. You see also the defense in nickel. You see Darren Kelly is a guy there on the middle part of your screen, just moving up to the line of scrimmage in the secondary on the near side as a flag comes in. That is a transfer from the North Dakota State College of Science, did not see the field much last year, still learning the system, but is working exclusively in slot. So Dom Davis, number 35, can, can just play corner only and not have to worry about the slot position. Yeah, because Dom Davis played that some of that last year, that nickel position, especially late in the year uh, when uh, the Bison needed him. But yeah, they're trying to find uh, who who's going to be the solid second guy at corner and then who is going to be the backup. We know that kid can play right there, number 21. There's no problem with him. He's one of the best cover guys in the entire country. It's the other side of the field that the Bison need to lock down. Uh, Wimbush is not able to play this spring, so Dom Davis and others are getting some really good reps at corner. Stick. Oh. Drafts by Purifoy there in the flat. Would have been a gain of close to five. He talked about Jalen Allison, told me he put on 10 pounds, that his <laughs> shoulders were feeling so bad at the end of last year, just getting taxed, that he knew he needed to get bigger. And he said, all I did when I went over Christmas break was eat all the time. <laughs> and he's up to 187 now. And another thing with Jalen, too, is that he, he's in a leadership position now. He's not just the young kid playing as he has been the last couple of years. He's the guy out there who's helping teach the ones that will come behind him. C.J. Smith did that. Marcus Williams did that. Now Jalen Allison is doing that. Coach Jensen, when we talked with him yesterday, said that, that uh, Allison is as good a cornerback as our offense will see all year long. So he is helping in positions like this and during practice to help the wide receivers get better, help the quarterback get better. 
Their play action rollout for Stick as they come bearing down, and that pass off the fingertips of Sean Angle. Dom Davis in on the coverage there, and Robbie Grimsley, also number five, that's walking right around midfield, has put on 12 pounds from where he was going into his junior season. So that. He's starting to look more like the safeties we used to <laughs> yeah. see with Christian Dudzik and Colton Hegel here. Well, we still have the camera on Engel, so there's one other point with him. We talked about his potential and what they hope he can turn into to being here at NDSU. And yes, the ceiling is high on this kid, but right now he is just inconsistent. He's as big as he is. He's getting jammed in practice. He's struggling to come off the line of scrimmage, so he's got to try to learn that to get his routes. And then once you get yourself free from the line, you need to make sure that you're at eight yards if it's an eight yard out, that type of thing. So that's what Engel is still trying to learn. The pass behind is intended target Dallas Freeman incomplete. Well, if you want to talk about positions of strength, you see, you know, right behind uh, Freeman there, number 87 is uh, is Wentz. He's his position group was deep already, solid already, and then it got even better this spring when they yeah. <laughs> when they moved Brock Robbins to tight end. This this tight end group is is as as good as uh, just because for, from the depth standpoint is as good as it may be ever. Yeah. And you talk about Ben Ellison as maybe your third or fourth tight end, not to mention, you know, some of the other kids behind the best, him. One, he could play wide out. I mean, Jeff Ilias and, and uh, you know, Matt Anderson, who might even get some reps at tight end. Another throw off target. Nate Jensen, we haven't mentioned yeah. him yet. I mean, we, you start talking tight ends with this offensive group, and there is uh, almost, uh, yeah, you know, an embarrassment of riches is, is one way to put it. Nate Jensen also missing the spring because he's still dealing with a leg injury he had late last year. We'll throw it back over to Alex Egan and Ryan Gellner as we take a quick break from game action anyway. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, punting on the field. We're going to play it like the uh, the Red Zone channel. We are not going to show you any punts. Uh, we don't need to worry about Jackson Koontz. He did just fine last year uh, in his first year with the Bison. Let's go down to Beth Hool, who is roaming the sidelines for us. Beth, what do you have for us? Hey, guys, joined by Nate Tangway on the mend right now. Why don't you fill Bison Nation in on, on how your uh, rehab has been going? Uh, the rehab's been going great. I've been, you know, running, doing all the conditioning stuff this entire month instead of playing. So my conditioning is really good right now. Uh, I'm cutting on the leg, and in about two weeks, I'll be able to start running with the team and doing everything fully. So, How has this process been for you? You're a competitor. Was it tough watching? Has it been tough watching spring ball? Uh, yeah, it really has. But, um, you know, it's kind of put me back and be able to focus on things like my conditioning um, that I haven't really been able to in the past. You know, I got the technique down and, you know, I know the playbook. But uh, being able to do stuff like that is, you know, has really helped me and it's going to push me to the next level. So and being able to help all the youngins. So that's exactly where it was taking us. Like you've done this before, Nate Tangway, the, the young guys out there right now. You just saw uh, the defensive unit w win a win a series there. What do you see from these guys? How do you guys look? Uh, I think we look really good. I mean, our one group and uh, some of our two deep group looks really, really good. Uh, we just need to start keep bringing along those uh, the younger guys, those twos and those threes, because you can really tell the difference between the one group's speed of play and the twos. And usually that's because of uh, thought process, how they're thinking. You know, they just hesitate on things. That once they get the playbook down and they start reading things faster, they just react faster and they look that much better. When you look at all of this, I mean. All of the injuries you guys took last year, uh, is there an increased focus now on that depth? You guys kind of know it better than ever now, how important that depth is to have? Absolutely. I mean, it's me and Seidel were both out by the end of the year, and we needed more depth at D-Tackle. I mean, we only had like two or three guys that were playing instead of five or six. So it's uh, we're really developing everybody as well as we can, and we're trying to move them along as fast as we can because, you know, you just never know when your last play is going to be and somebody else needs to step up. Well, hopefully you're not passing on any of these fashion uh, critiques to any of the young guys. We'll see, though, in, in the tank there. All right, guys, we'll pass it back to you guys as uh, the team gets back on the field here soon. <laughs> All right, thanks, Beth. Yeah, pass along my regards to, to uh, Nate and his his showing off the guns here. <laughs> Spring workouts, right? You got to show off the guns a little bit. So we've seen uh, the the ones and the twos, offense and defense. We saw the two offense kind of march down the field mm -hmm. on the two defense. What do you make of uh, what we've seen kind of so far here? Well, I think kind of as expected right now we're seeing a lot of the backups and that's by design the the backups in this game it's what matters it, we're not talking about the first 22 or 25 guys we're trying to figure out the next 25 and that's what the coaching staff works on in spring ball is who's that next 25 you look back to the James Madison game I think you could argue that James Madison's depth 
last year mm -hmm. was better than mm -hmm. North Dakota State's depth. NDSU needs to develop depth, so we need to figure out, NDSU coaches need to figure out who the next 25 are, and, and that's what this spring game is about. That's, that's what you have to figure out here. And really, we shouldn't be surprised that the number one defense was on point already, even though they are missing a, a guy like Nate Tangway. Nine starters are coming back for this defense, and Matt Entz is still you know, entering. Uh, he's got the continuity there. But it's the offense that, uh, you know, they're still trying to work things out. It's not easy to have Courtney Messingham step in here and get everything established in 15 practices and however many film sessions you can have. But th this is a work in progress for this Bison offense. Yeah, it absolutely is. You go back to Courtney Messingham and you wonder how much of that, that jive that Tim Polisic had and the passion that Tim Polisic had. How much of that and where's that going to come from Bison coaching staff? So it's more than just X's and O's. There's a lot of meshing and things that these guys need to figure out. Brian and Lee, the spring game, you, you think kind of as expected. We didn't expect a lot of flash. We expected a lot of plays. Is that what you guys take as well? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ryan and Alex. And I, and I I think the one area you talk about depth, LT, and one thing Chris Kleiman had mentioned, even Matt Entz talked about it, is depth is one thing, but where it really shows up is on special teams. If you don't have guys on special teams that can get it done, Chris Kleiman made no bones about it. We are not as good on special teams last year as we needed yeah. to be. And I think that showed up, especially in the last half of the season. Well, special teams is obviously important. We've seen over the course of the championship runs how many starters, how many key guys were in there on, uh, you know, uh, in on the kickoff team or the punt coverage team. So, yeah, you're right. It does make a difference. But uh, when you're talking about a position of depth and you go back to what Beth was talking with Nate uh, Tangway, I mean, this defensive line. Oh. It, it is it's as deep I don't know if it's as good as it's ever been but it's as deep as it's ever been uh, defensive ends you can rotate a bunch of guys in there the defensive tackles because Steidel hasn't played because uh, Tangway hasn't played you've got other guys in there and you're going to take guys who used to be defensive ends slide them inside so not only is it deep but there is some variety that you can attack other offenses with and having guys at linebacker and at safety that can run, that translates over to special teams, too. You have guys yeah. get down the field a little bit. Randy Hedberg, you talked to him. Who surprised him most this spring? It was actually the punter. Well, was one of the guys that Randy mentioned. He said Jackson Koontz. He goes, we were talking just about guys who look good. He, and he said, and this sounds really strange because, remember, Jackson played at, a, uh, <laughs> at SMU. an F SMU. So he was at an FBS program. But this is the first time that he's actually worked in a strength and conditioning program <laughs> you know, after football. Sounds odd. You know, last time I checked, the punter's still on the team. He should be working out with the team. But, yeah, so he's added uh, a little bit of length to his punts. We know he can send it sky high, but if you're getting another five or ten yards out of that, you're loving it. So the two's back on the field here, and that will be our first opportunity to see Henry Van Dellen, a redshirt freshman out of the Twin Cities. Big kid, big arm. Tim Polisek really liked him when he came to camp, offered him, and... Of course, right on the spot, Henry accepted, and here he is. Van Dellen fires it was, off target. We saw the arm strength. One of the things that, that Coach Hedberg is working on with Van Dellen is to try to take the length of his backswing and shorten it. We already know, I mean, he can leverage the ball down the field, but he's got a pretty long arm swing. So they're trying to short it, shorten it, try and compact it a little bit. And when you're altering your the movement that you've had, your natural throwing motion, it's it's difficult to do. They're, they're working on it, though, one of the things. On the Egg Country Farm Credit Services scoreboard, it's actually 10-7 in favor of the goal. But again, the goal jumped out real early, and now the green defensively have done a nice job here the last couple of series. Play action hard. Van Dellen can run it a little bit. Gets close to a first down. And you know, Van Dellen, a small school kid, came mm -hmm. from Providence Academy, 3A. Uh, the competition level, you know, was not great, certainly at that level, but when they saw his frame, they really liked him. Another adjustment, though, that, that Henry's had to make is how many times you think he was under center in high school? <laughs> he wasn't. Not at all. He wasn't. So now that that's is something you take for granted as a quarterback that you're taking snaps from the center, but in today's spread offenses, you don't do that much. So this right here, getting up, under center, taking the snap here from uh, from Shunick, something he hasn't had to do a lot of. 
Um, showing another North Dakota kid on the offensive line. They've been able to find a bunch of those guys and a big hole here for Purifoy. Inside the 10, the 5, and I think he's in for a touchdown. Yes. As he runs into the tunnel. Almost out of sight from everybody. Well, it's pretty simple to say that was well blocked because Damaris had a, just a monster hole and was able to run to the flag and beat the pursuit there. But that was well done up front by the offensive line. You saw leading the way there was actually Zach Koontz, who was a walk-on redshirt freshman from Grand Forks Red River. And a big kid, Tyler Roll, telling us a little bit yesterday that Needs to improve his flexibility, but he's already big enough to do a lot of the things that he does. And he's also a 4-0 student in architecture studies here at NDSU, so a kid you don't have to worry about in the classroom either. When you're talking about offensive linemen and North Dakota kids and walk-ons, I know Kubis from Dickinson Trinity was another guy that uh, the coaches were saying, you know, he has been impressive in his first actual time to, uh, to come in and play. Here's our Nodak Insurance uh, Company replay. Nice block out front. That's the one you're talking about. You get to switch the hips on two of the defensive backs, and you're going to have a, a long run, and Purefoy gets it into the, into the end zone. You know, it's really those those two guys, Brooks and, and Purefoy, have really have uh, gotten a lot of opportunities this spring, haven't they? Yeah, and that's I think that's by design. I think with Bruce Henderson and Lance, you kind of know what you have with those two guys. And certainly Adam Cofield was going through spring ball, a guy they were pretty high on. I know Tim Polisek, before he left uh, to take over as offensive line coach at Iowa this offseason, had a lot of good things to say about Cofield as he was participating as the scout team running back last fall. There's a look at Cofield, who was committed to Missouri State until very late in the recruiting period and just a couple of days before signing day took a visit to North Dakota State switched his commitment and here he is Yeah, from uh, Blue Springs High School out of Lee Summit Missouri right down there by Kansas City so uh, the Bison have had some <laughs> some uh, good athletes come from that area uh, I still have some on the team but nice to snatch one away from a conference opponent and Blue Springs South who oh, they've been good they've been really time. good <laughs> And there's that's the, the highest level of football, too, by the way, in Missouri at 6A. And there's Ty Brooks, the former Fargo South Bruin. Good open field tackle there by Jackson Brown, who looks much bigger this spring than certainly what he looked like last fall. On that play, I was watching Brock Robbins do his, uh, his new position at tight end. And, of course, it's in some instances, and we've seen it a lot, that the tight ends and the fullbacks can almost be interchangeable on this play because here is Robbins leading, being the leading blocker on that particular play. Brock Robbins excited for the potential to actually have the football in his hands <laughs> for the first time ever in his career. That Cavalier, he touched it a lot. He had 4,000 <laughs> rushing yards, so yeah, I could say he's definitely in, uh, in in that category of a guy that can certainly carry the ball and secure it and do some things with it. And Bison able to get the first down there, just pound it over the right side. When we were talking about Coach Messingham, too, uh, you know, he comes from a pro-style you know, background. We've touched on that a little bit. The interesting thing, though, is I don't know if Coach Messingham has had in his past a lot of A-gap power. We know how A-gap power is is a play that the Bison have just hung their hat on, especially through these championship years. And so I think that's a that's a, a play that, that Coach Mess has had to get used to a little bit. And, you know, when it comes crunch time, how many times will he go to it? That type of thing. Boy, look how fast Jabril Cox beat his man. He had no chance on the outside. I don't know if that was Jack Albrecht or who was playing out there. I think it was Johnson, actually. Oh, was it? Ben Hecht was also, I think, in that area, but you can just see the two quick strides off the line of scrimmage. Watch 42 <laughs> just fly right by Josh Howison, who is a guard from Baxter, Minnesota, went to Brainerd High School. When all else fails, it pays to be fast. I mean, why, you know, Greg Menard, who's, you know, we haven't touched on him. He's not going to be out here, but I mean, why is Greg Menard as good as he is? He just blows off the ball so fast. Why is Jabril, Jabril Cox able to make that play look so easy? Because he is just a half a step faster than everybody else. Van Dellen taking it up for a couple of yards. Of course, you don't tackle 
even when the twos are going, you, you know, in your tackles, you don't ever tackle the quarterback. That's just a rule. You saw Mercadell come up and oop, has to pull back. Mercadell has been battling through a knee injury this spring. It was quite a questionable today whether he would be able to get any reps in, but able to get it back healthy enough to give himself a chance to get out here a little bit. Guy that was recruited out of the Oakland area by Jamar Kane before he left in the offseason to head to Fresno State. And Dellen completes another one of those big tight ends. And Anderson. And Anderson, I think, had, what, three receptions last year. Played some limited reps, but another big body at that position. Yeah, again, that tight end group is is uh, is one that, that I really look for. You, just, you have so many options with that group. And when you have a kid like Jeff Ilias who leads that group, and, and we've talked about it, if you watched our coverage, you know, in recent years when Ilias has come in, and, I mean, yes, he's a tight end. Yes, he's big. Yes, he blocks. But he's a kid who can go out, flex out, and even go wide and, and be a wide out even. Ryan Geller, Alex Egan, back over on our set. All right, thank you very much, guys. Good to see some uh, some big plays going there. The touchdown run from Damaris Purifoy was pretty good. Uh, Beth Hool working uh, the sidelines to try and get somebody to talk to for us. We'll get down to her in just a second. What are you taking away from this uh, this first little early action that we're seeing here? I think some nice shiftiness from Purifoy, who we haven't seen a whole lot of, but he at running back is very shifty. He's got some outside speed. That's been good to see. And then watching a little bit of the defensive backs, uh, a couple of guys moving in and out and doing some things like that has been good to see on the defensive end. All right, Beth Hool has caught up with somebody down on the uh, Bison offensive sideline. Beth, what do you have for us? Hey guys, that's right. Joined by Damaris Purifoy. Had a touchdown there. How'd that one feel? It felt pretty good. First time getting the end zone today. Um, been working real hard this uh, spring. It's good to see that finally paying off. What's it like fighting for a position with such a deep group of running backs that you guys have? It's real competitive. You know, it makes us want to work each hard every day. So I'm achieving a goal to achieve, and that's to play for the NDSU. How big of a growth have you made in the spring game alone, in the spring season alone? What you sound like? I hear you. <laughs> how how big of a growth? How much have you changed and developed already this spring? I say a lot. Like it's been a big change. My coach says, Coach Messenham, he said I changed a lot since like the first practice to um, this practice. So it's good to finally see changes. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, best of luck the rest of this uh, spring game. Get in that end zone again, Thank bud. You. Guys, back to you. Boy, Purifoy still out of <laughs> breath a little bit, trying to give that interview to Beth. After some long run, and there's Lance Dunn again with Thud. And Levi Jordheim, and what a great story for Levi. Just coming out this past week, we were told Levi is now on scholarship at NDSU after coming as a walk-on, getting his opportunity as a scholarship player in his third year. Well, congratulations to him. It takes uh, a while to earn that. He did. He chose to walk on and try to get to where he is. And I thought an interesting thing when we were talking with Coach Hans about Levi and the development he's made, he says that, that Jordheim reminds him now of where MJ Stump was two years ago. And we know how MJ's career went, you know, his junior and senior year especially. So, yeah, they've... They're looking for some big things for number 45. It was Easton Stick on a design quarterback run. We certainly know Easton can do that. He did that a bunch last season. When you look at his numbers for Easton Stick, 685 rushing yards and seven rushing touchdowns. Now, guys, Courtney Messingham, his thought process on running the quarterback a lot, not a lot, and he said, we got to be smart when we do it. We got to do it in when we need a first down or when we need a touchdown in the red zone. But outside of that, we're going to be selective. In terms of finishing it, uh, you know, finishing a run, yeah. being physical. Yeah, get what you get and then get down unless you need that first down. He said, yeah, uh, the, and the very first meeting he had was stick. That he brought that point up. He said, we need you for all 15 games. That's something Carson Wentz had to learn in his first year <laughs> as a professional as well. He took a couple of pops early in his pro career and... Well, if we want to talk about a guy right there, 53, talk about a guy who's establishing himself uh, this spring, Cole Karch. I mean, we we saw glimpses of his ability, but he's really taken off this spring, big time. Yes, moving over to defensive tackle from defensive end, right around 263, four pounds, somewhere in there. 
I think the goal is to get up to 270, but an explosive, explosive player in the middle. And a guy that I think, especially in passing downs, can be very dynamic from that defensive tackle position rushing the passer. Uh, described to us as one of the strongest guys on the team. There's DeMars again. Of course, uh, Grimsley can't come up and put a lick on him, so again, it's, you know, it's thud. These, these, these guys know how to play, they know how to tackle, they don't need to bring guys down. Nodak Insurance Company replay, Purifoy bounced it last time. There's Grimsley comes up, gives him that little touch, plays dead. Also see number one, Chris Board has been on and off the field a little bit here in this uh, first half of the spring game. One of three players that Matt Ensign has taken the biggest jump forward. Chris Board, Cole Karch, and James Hendricks. Yes. The former quarterback, been moved to safety. I think they're going to get a touch on, uh, on stick in the backfield as we see Greg Menard slide off. Talk to Greg a little bit too, LT. So what was it like this off season? You know, he had, didn't play for national title. He goes, it was awful at first. I couldn't bring myself to watch the title game, but he goes, it was probably good from us, for us from a conditioning standpoint to actually get a full three months off before spring ball. They have not had that since he's been here. Opportunity to get this bodies healed before we get to this point, get to the spring. Coaches had more time to recruit, which they haven't had before. Would they trade it all for another ring? Yes, but it is kind of... Um, refreshing maybe to have that extra time. Well, it is almost time for our Proceed Halftime Report. Here's our Proceed interview with Chris Berg. For the Proceed Halftime Report, if you need seed, think Proceed. With us now is the owner of Proceed, Keith Peltier. Keith, great to have you back. Yeah, it's good to be back here. Guys are starting to get in the field a little bit, at least in the Southern Valley. So talk about what, what are you seeing as far as the mix of crops that they're planting this year? Well, um, our sales are up probably 20, 25% on beans. I know that North Dakota, when they did the USDA analysis, they only showed up 12, but we think it's gonna be up a little bit higher than that. Replacing wheat, mainly in the Northern Valley, and corn, which wasn't very profitable, the budget, um, I think that's gonna be about unchanged because the corn growers that are used to growing corn are you know, kind of sticking with their rotation. Speaking about beans, talk to us about your Extend and your Liberty Beans. Yeah, yeah so the uh, Extend Beans and Liberty Beans are two choices that we have to do the um, for the resistant weeds, which is becoming a problem. It's kind of started in the south, uh, southern valley, and is moving up to, you know, about the Grand Forks area, and then probably over to the Carrington area, and then south. That's kind of the quadrant where the weed resistance is picking up. So we have two choices in that. Liberty beans, which uh, we've handled for several years and is a good choice, and then extend beans, which is a new off trade offering from Monsanto, um, which also gets these resistant weeds, and we're just uh, ramping up for that for this year. Last year, we just had a little bit of seed production. This year, we've got quite a bit of stuff that we're getting out, and it, it's uh, been well received by by the growers. Good to hear that as well. We appreciate you being here again. If you need seed, think pro seed. Thank you very much, Keith, and stick around. Much more coming up here on the Bison Spring Game Show. Welcome back inside the Fargo Dome. Uh, just going through field goal right now. Cam Peterson looking good, able to knock through a few of uh, his attempts there as uh, we get closer and closer to halftime here. As Cam Peterson had a big field goal last year. You should pull your microphone down there, buddy. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> Busy now watching the action. Yeah, I know you are. Cam Peterson had a huge yes. field goal last year. There was a big one against Iowa. A lot of Bison fans definitely remember that one as uh, we get a... A little bit more and more into uh, this spring game they've kind of blocked off and they're starting to do kind of the uh, the specialty things that they need to work on as this is a practice you still got to get your practice in uh, speaking of practice I was able to go to a practice earlier in this spring and mic up the other new coach that has joined the Bison football team and that is Buddha Williams great name it's a great name and he's a got a he's got a great room that he's inherited as the defensive ends coach Here you go. Here you go. All right, my name is LaDominique Williams. Hey! My go by Buddha. Here you go. Hey. Work on your tighter. Uh, you got to have tighter hands. Give me one more rep after him. 
I was born with as a baby. I was fat and bow-legged, and then I could never shake the name, and it, and it stuck with me ever since. So uh, every city I go to, I, I somehow uh, the name follows me. All right, finish on this side over here. Yeah, right there. Yep, right there. That's perfect. A former um, guy I used to work for, Jimmy Burrow, was at Ohio University, who I worked for Ohio University. He was a former coach here at NDSU. So when the job popped open, I mean, I, I, I mean, that was kind of my uh, my end with, with was through uh, Coach Burrow, and I had to jump all over it now just because of the tradition and how excited I was just to be a part of this place and be a part of this tradition. Five, three, one, two, three. Hey, let's go, man. Base down, get off. Base down, get off. Get your butts off. Let's go. Speed your feet up, man. Speed your feet up. We playing way too slow. Hey, hey, hey. There you go, there you go. Where are they? Did it, hey, hey. Blue A. Did it, hey. Well, I underestimated the city a little bit. I thought it was kind of nothing here, but just, just land. Um, but when I got here, I mean, I was blown away. Uh, bigger city than, probably most, uh, bigger city than most places I've been through my stops. Um, but the community is, is great. I love the community. I love the fans. Uh, everybody's so friendly here. So it made me feel right at home. Hey, jump, 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 jump. There you go, there you go, there you go. Let's go. Oh, I love it. Let's I mean, go. We ain't even full, full going hey. yet. I mean, spring ball, we treat spring ball like it's, like it's the regular season, which, which is awesome. Let's I never go. been part of any, anything like that. Break, there you go, Greg. That's, that's your best one of a uh, uh, spring. Hey, break, there you go. Live with feet, though. Speed your feet up. Speed your feet up. Hey, break. There you, there you go. There you go, Greg. There you go. Hey. I couldn't be more blessed with, uh, with, with the room I inherited with, uh, with Greg Menard, Tuska, uh, both Tuska brothers, Stanley, Caleb Butler. I mean, I, I just couldn't be I walk into a great room. So, um, and them guys, I, I lean on them guys a lot, and I just try to bring what I can, just, just my little bit of knowledge and try to help them through teach some stuff, but and also lean on them guys, too, leaning lean on my DNs. Right, you get too close to it right here. All right, give it a little bit more. You got me? Give it a little bit more. Boom, a little, little bit more room coming over. Make sense on that? You getting too close. Let's go. Give them a little more wiggle too, man. I'm not trying to play tradition, so they just going to play and do what they know. I'm going to just be some technique stuff. Um, might be, but, but tradition is tradition. I, don't, I won't break that now. Them dudes going to still, still hold up the end of the bargain and uh, carry that torch and then keep the tradition alive. All right, so you obviously knew the guy who Buda Williams is taking over for pretty well, Jamar Kane, who's taking off uh, another job now at Fresno State. What did you make of, of Buda, and, and where do you think he's going to fit in, especially considering what Jamar Kane brought here? Well, NDSU couldn't keep the secret about Jamar Kane anymore. Right. Too many people knew about this guy. He got away, and probably rightfully so, because Jamar Kane is a heck of a football coach. You enter Buda Williams. It's all about speed, and it's all about technique at the defensive end spot, and then it's all about motor, and you saw some of Buda Williams' motor right there. He's a guy that is passionate, can push that on, and Oh, by the way, it helps to have Greg Menard at defensive end as well. So build upon what Jamar did and then add your own flavor to it. And if these defensive ends can continue to rise, we've seen one, Kyle Emanuel, already in the NFL. Greg Menard is a name that gets thrown around there. Yeah. He walks into such a great job, and he's got the motor and he's got the passion to bring it. All right, let's go over to the guys in the booth who have uh, seen what those guys, what his room can do, Buddha Williams, guys. All right, thanks so much. And yeah, I think Buddha Williams, a guy that, you know, we talked to Chris Kleiman a little bit about the hiring process for him. And the biggest reason is because he came in with another candidate, and they thought the other candidate had the upper hand. But when they actually met with Buddha Williams, he blew them away in the interview process. And the guy that they thought they were going to hire, they went with the other guy. Yeah, went with the other guy. And, and uh, in terms of, I know Buddha's on the defensive side, but we're already seeing, or will this fall, see an additional player because of the contact where he is from, because Buddha was the guy that knew Desmond Kane and had the connection with Kane because he had been recruiting him before. And so the Bison are going to gain a wide receiver because of that already. Had a lot of good experience, too, from Ohio to Illinois to Tennessee mm -hmm. Martin. That's where he came from as well. We'll take a quick break and be back with more here at the annual Green and Golds game in the scrimmage brought to you by Gate City Bank here at the Fargo Dome.
Welcome back inside the Fargo Dome. We are at what they're calling halftime. The first 30 <laughs> plays are in the books. The gold has the 18 to 16 lead, the offense over the defense here at what we are calling halftime. Uh, this has been uh, pretty good so far. The, the main thing is we haven't seen anybody get injured, and that's the big part. That's the ones key. obviously are not uh, going full speed, but of the twos and the threes, we're seeing them. Everybody has been able to get up mm -hmm. off the ground here. Let's go down to Beth Hool, who is field side. Beth. Hey guys, joined by Dr. Bruce Pyatt for our Sanford Orthopedic Sports Medicine Injury Report. Doc, this is a busy time of year for you and your staff uh, as that football season ends. How busy were you guys this year, maybe in comparison to years past? You know, it's kind of been an interesting year. We had the unfortunate uh, feeling of losing earlier than we're used to, but it also gave us a little bit more time to recuperate for the athletes. So we spent uh, the first part of uh, the, this year, the January, February, kind of getting the athletes into their mode of either right in strong with their rehab programs or really getting their surgeries done that they needed to. And it really gave us a lot longer time to get them through the recovery phase, which has been nice. This is the first spring I can remember in many, many years where we've had to make decisions more based on what's right for the athlete from the performance standpoint rather than what's right for them from their injury standpoint. So there's guys that may not be playing today that could be, but we're just trying to keep them out of things, let the younger guys get their exposures they need to and give these guys a little bit longer to recuperate. That extra rest time is important for anyone, but particularly for an athlete, for somebody who puts so much labor on their body. Uh, how, how valuable is this? How will they see this maybe even after their football careers benefit them? I think it allows them to go into the next phase, which is this summer when they really need to do some of their real strong conditioning in a good feeling. You know, in past years, they've been still trying to recuperate from things, trying to get over the aches and pains, and now they're really at a point that they can really push without a lot of those concerns. So I think it's going to help them to be stronger as the next season comes. And as always, that partnership with NDSU, how supportive have they been and continue to be just in uh, making sure that everything's done right with, with these players and their health as the number one priority? You know, we may have been winning national championships on the field in football and other sports doing very well, but I can tell you behind the scenes, they win it every day. There's never been a moment uh, that I can remember with th these staffs that they come to me and push the limit beyond what it should be. They, they understand their roles, they understand our roles, and they let us do our job. And then when those athletes are ready, then they take control of them. So it's really been an incredible partnership for us. I never worry about it. Such a valuable partnership and continue to do great things. Thank you, Dr. Pyatt, for uh, your continued presence here on the sidelines with us and with the team. Guys, we'll toss it up to you after the Stanford Orthopedic Sports Medicine Injury Report. All right, thank you very much, Beth. Uh, there's a guy that uh, has joined over uh, Brian Sean there in our broadcast position booth. Uh, he knows a thing or two about having to stay healthy and uh, looking forward to the future. Uh, Zach Johnson has made his way over to talk to Brian Sean. Brian. All right. Thanks so much, guy. I love a guy standing next to me that makes me look so small. You know, it makes me look a really, like a really small guy. <laughs> Zach, uh, thanks so much for taking a few minutes with oh, us. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah, it's great. It's great to see you again. I know uh, you have some some pro aspirations. I know you were able to participate in most of the drills when you had a chance to play in your all-star game in January. At recovery. Uh, it's been going well. I mean, can't really complain. I was running a lot sooner than I thought I was going to be running. And, you know, the rehab went good. The strengthening went good. And still still getting there. Still almost 100% pretty much. So it's, it's getting there. Going through that experience of playing in an all-star game, uh, I think you were in the Shrine game, I believe, right, Zach? And, and you had a chance to, to go up against some really good competition. How much did that help you in, in terms of gauge where you're at against some of the other great players from around the country? Uh, you know, it was, it, it's always a... You know, it was fun. I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, you get to go against guys that played in the SEC, ACC, every conference from around the country. And it was a good opportunity for me to show that I can play at that level with those guys, you know, coming from the SEC and the ACC and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was fun for me. And I did very well until I got hurt. And, but, you know, stuff happens. Well, obviously we've got a week to go until the NFL draft, and then potentially we'll see what happens, where you end up, where you land. And it's kind of an exciting week. I'm guessing uh, you're ready for it to, to come to an end and just find out kind of where you land and what happens. Yeah, you know, it's it's a waiting game now. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited. 
I'm happy to go wherever I can go and, you know, go out there and prove that I belong. All right. Thanks so much for yeah. joining us, Zach. And, hey, best wishes, too. We'll keep an eye out next weekend. See Absolutely. Where you Thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much. Zach thanks. Johnson joining us here on our broadcast of the Green and Gold game here this afternoon. Game action taking place uh, behind me as the second half is back in uh, to play once again. And uh, we take a look at some of uh, the twos that are back out on the field once again. And uh, chance for in the red zone, I believe the ones are actually going at it once again uh, as Easton Stick is in the shotgun <laughs> working inside the 10 yard line. And Lance Dunn to the outside, pushed by Robbie Grimsley out at the six. And LT back with me. You had a chance to catch up with Landon Leckler, who actually came up with Big Zach, who's I also I... also looking to see if he can play some professional football. I down just the road. asked him where he's been out to Seattle. He just got back from Cincinnati. He's been talking to a few people, working out here in town. And uh, you know, the hope is you get drafted. But if not, you set yourself up for, you know, a free agency chance. So yeah, he'll he'll get a he'll get a chance with someone. I hope. You know, the big look at Pro Day when it was here just a was on the month ago line. was the offensive line. Jack Placker, Zach Johnson, and certainly Landon Leckler. How about a throwback, throwback. pass? That's Colin Connor oh. onto the five-yard <laughs> line. That is a, a Joe Heg special from the <laughs> national championship game that did not work when they ran it. Well, too bad this is thud because I wanted to see somebody <laughs> trying to tackle the big guy. <laughs> 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 look at Stick coming in and bumping him. Your Nodak Insurance Company replay, setting it up, and then Connor. In fact, Landon and I were just talking about uh, about Mr. Connor there and how he had to come in as a, as a freshman last year and earn a position, and now there's potential to, to slide him maybe to guard, depending how Raidens comes and all kinds of things like that. So, again, there's some versatility among that talent uh, on the offensive line. Cole Davis in the game. High Got across it. the middle, and there are the hands of Ben Ellison, who did not catch a pass last year as Redford's freshman here out of Poly, Minnesota. But you saw right there, he has the potential to add that dimension. Yeah, that pass was just a little bit high. He was able to go up and get it. And we've talked about the pass catching ability of Jeff Ilias in that position group from the tight end. Nodak Insurance Company replay once again. Slides on the inside, cuts, goes up and gets it. Yeah, they want him to emerge as someone to take reps in that passing game. So Peterson on for the extra points. Peterson knocks it through, and we will take a quick timeout here as uh, we have just started the second half of play, 25-16 score here on the Egg Country Farm Credit Services scoreboard. Cape City Bank, our sponsor of the Bison Spring Game Green Gold Preview. Jackson Coates hitting a couple of pretty big booming punts. We're not showing that, obviously, because we don't need to. <laughs> we are almost done here with the green and gold spring game uh, here from the Fargo Dome. Uh, you, we just heard from Zach Johnson, uh, uh, Zach Johnson, as well as uh, Landon Leckler and Jack Plankers, three staples of the Bison offensive line are all gone now having graduated from uh, NDSU. So we take a look, at, uh, brought to you by Nodak Insurance, of what the offensive line might look like this year and we got Luke Bacon out there on a tackle. Austin Cooner has moved from center to guard. Tanner Volson is filling in at center. He did that for the first two games while Austin Cooner was out last year. Uh, and then we see Bryce Mesner, who is not participating today. Hopefully he can uh, get himself back healthy and uh, and then Colin Connor. But like we heard from those guys saying, uh, Co Coach uh, Courtney Messingham, the offensive coordinator, would like to have eight guys that they're able to rotate in. And that's nothing new for the Bison offensive line. No, they've graduated and, and moved some pieces around. When you graduate three seniors you've got to find some a way to get your best guys on the field and moving those pieces around is a way to do just that we didn't mention Dylan Redunes who's going to see a lot of time at offensive line possibly at a couple of different spots but to get the best five on the field to start the game that's kind of the goal and that's the reason to move all those guys around the offensive line you graduate three and it's still your staple it's still your big part of your offense that means you had some nice guys yeah. playing there last year and playing a lot uh, Brian and Lee I know you guys have been talking about the offensive line off and on all day today you just got done talking to a couple of the guys who are now missing off of that offensive <laughs> line yeah thanks so much and you know we 
we they talked about a little bit but don't be surprised if a colin connor moves inside mm -hmm. to guard to make room for a guy like radunes who the coaches at least one coach told me believes he is ahead of where joe Hegg and billy turner were at, at this, this point thing. in yep. their careers which is unbelievable to think considering the careers those guys had here i think you just go back to that offensive line or you know we go and we talk to people and ask us all the time you know how are the bison going to be and i just use two simple words very good they're going to be very good again <laughs> we just saw ty brooks i believe run uh, for a touchdown behind us on a well blocked uh run there by the two so that was certainly good to see and you know, I guys, I think that's the, when the staple is they know they're going to be able to run the football. If they're going to be as good up front as we think. On both sides of the ball, the Bison will once again be a very difficult team to defend and score against coming up in 2017 as we look at the schedule coming up for NDSU. And that starts on Saturday, September 2nd against Mississippi Valley State, Eastern Washington on the road, and then Robert Morris before getting into Valley play. South Dakota State, another interesting <laughs> road game along with the road game at Illinois State. It's going to be a fun year for us. Yeah, we're going to be busy, and you're going to watch it. We know that, so that'll be fun. Yeah, we got 10 of the games coming up uh, statewide. Well, Thanks so much for joining us here on the annual Green and Gold game from the Fargo Dome. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. As for Brian Sean, Lee Timmerman, Ryan Gellner, Beth Houle, I'm Alex Egan. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you in the fall.